ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Elizabeth Seaton Lectures, the Religious Studies Department of Mount St. Vincent University, with the sponsorship of the Sisters of Charity, is pleased to offer the 13th annual Elizabeth Seaton Lecture Series. And to bring this time to the Mount and to our area, an outstanding scholar of Christian thought on, in healthcare decision making for others. Dr. Abian Lynch is currently the director of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. This afternoon, Dr. Lynch will talk to us on elders' ethics. Please welcome Dr. Lynch. Thank you very much for your introduction and for your welcome. Uh, as you'll know, this is the third lecture in a series and I've been talking until now about the tyranny of autonomy. And just to repeat, uh, in case you hadn't been here before, I was speaking about autonomy in the general framework of self-determination, meaning that people who are seen to be autonomous are people who can choose their own direction. They can choose to prevent themselves from harm, and they can choose to take that course of action which is meant to be beneficial to them. There are a great many debates about what the grounding for autonomy is. That's not my point. I'm just going to say that I'm speaking about it in terms of the ability to choose one's own course. And in the first of the lectures, I was speaking about children, uh, children as young people who have never had an opportunity to exercise autonomy simply because they are too young. But young people whom we expect will develop autonomy of their own. And in the second lecture, I was speaking about persons who have mental retardation or cognitive impairment from the time they are born. And so we never expect that they will have the opportunity to choose for themselves or to be self-determining. And my particular concern in those two lectures and in this lecture has to do with the kinds of choices we make for people who cannot choose for themselves, particularly with reference to health care. And so I've spoken of the tyranny of autonomy and used that phrase to say that those who have autonomy have often labeled other persons or identified them as non-autonomous for a variety of reasons, many of which turn out to be the self-interest of the one who is doing the labeling. So now I'd like to turn attention to elderly persons, and I can do that with some confidence, joining that group myself, and noting that in the audience there are a number of people who are standing with me, and certain that all of us within the room will be older by the time we're finished. Uh, if not having reached the official definition. Within the group of individuals for whom health care and social decisions must often be made are the elderly. These people who are our parents, perhaps us, our relatives, our neighbors, are identified as those who have reached a chronological age of 65 plus. In that framework, they are grouped as the young old, the middle old, and the very old. And sometimes in terms of the very old, we begin to speak about those who are very old and very fragile. Of course, developmental age may vary significantly from chronological age, and election of the year 65 as the year for being officially old is really an arbitrary matter historical but arbitrary. The numbers of older people are growing thanks in part to the advances of medical science and technology. In other words, many people who might not have lived to the age of 65 are now doing so partly because of improved, for example, medication, 
partly because of improved diagnostic service, partly because of improved community health services, like the treatment of water, sewage, vaccination, and so on. And of course, many are living longer thanks to the marvels of technology. That is to say, to the ability now to provide artificial nutrition and hydration, artificial respiratory assistance, organ transplants, and so on. Now, not all of these older people have limited mental capacity, but many do as a result of stroke, depression, coma, or neurological illness like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. One estimate suggests that between 10 and 18 percent of all persons aged 65 or older suffer from some form of dementia, and that 15 to 20 percent of those who are over 80 years of age can be placed in this category. For those who are concerned with surrogate decision-making, the numbers are daunting, and the responsibility for the choices to be made is truly awesome. In simplest terms, I'm speaking here of individuals who were once competent to make decisions both for themselves and for us. The situation is now reversed or moving in that direction. These people may have diminishing or diminished competence. Their cognitive ability may be intermittent or absent. In this dimension, our elders are very much like very young children. In some cases, they may have the characteristics of those who have profound mental retardation. For those who watch this deterioration, there is anguish, sometimes anger and guilt. For those undergoing this move towards incompetence and who realize it, there is frustration, anxiety, a sense of abandonment. And any move, slow or quick, from independence to dependence, physical, mental, or social, can only be frightening and lonely for those who perceive it happening to themselves. At the outset, it should be clear that competence to choose or refuse health care or to manage everyday living or financial affairs is not an all or nothing matter. Competence is task specific. It is tied to the situation and the circumstances. Speaking now only of consent to health care and competence tied very closely to that, legal competence entails, number one, the ability to communicate, which means the ability to take in, to receive, and to give back information. Understand that many who would be labeled incompetent just on the grounds of inability to communicate might very well be deaf they might very well not understand the language, and they might be seen by those who are not clever enough to look behind appearances as incompetent. To be legally competent also implies that one has access to the type of information which is needed for the situation. In terms of informed consent in medicine, there are some very strict requirements that one would know the nature of the procedure, that one would know the consequences of having that procedure, that one would know the side effects of receiving that procedure, that one would know the alternatives, and that one would know the consequences of not choosing the procedure. On the grounds of having information and the ability to sift through it, those who don't have information might also be labeled incompetent, not because they have the information and can't use it, but because the information might have been given in such a way that they don't understand it, in a language not their own, in some of the four-syllable words, which are very common as we speak about medical treatment. The third of the characteristics of legal competence is called understanding. 
It means that the person not only has the ability and has the information, but also understands. Understanding implies that the individual can use that information towards that person's individual goals. Sometimes we wonder, and I'm standing back now with physicians, we wonder when patients come with their children whether they have understood. They have the information, they have the ability, but often they block this out because of emotion, because of fear of some kind, because of anxiety, a variety of pressures. So a person could be called incompetent, who doesn't understand when the person has the capacity, but simply hasn't had the time to absorb. We have studies which show, for example, that in so-called breaking bad news to persons who may have cancer, they were there, they can communicate, they had the information, but they've totally blocked out what they heard. So understanding as a third measure. The next is that the individual shall be free, that the individual, in other words, shall have a kind of voluntariness, that a person shall not be forced or not under duress in order to take up the kind of information and to deal with it. To be free, to have a voluntary choice, is a very difficult thing to do. Difficult in psychological terms, and I'm not going to explore that, but very difficult in terms of the pressure of an institution, for example. One of my departments in the medical faculty is obstetrics, and I heard one of my residents say the other day, now look, Mrs. Jones, everybody else on this ward has said yes. What's wrong with you? Whether that patient was free is a very large question. And there are other ways to be unfree. To be pressured by one's family to comply may not be the epitome of freedom. The last mark, of course, is that the consent or the refusal shall be continuing, not just a one-time thing. It's not just signing that form as you go into the hospital. It means that you're able all the way through the piece to say yes or to say no under the conditions that have been listed. So the notion of legal competence, which entails communication, information which can be processed, understanding applied to that, the ability to choose and to have a continuing state of affairs is a very strict kind of definition. What that implies is that I may be competent to look after my bank account on Monday and on Wednesday, but not on Tuesday. And that if I'm competent to look after my bank account, I may very well not be competent to consent or to refuse medical treatment. They are different situations, different skills required, different information, and so on. I may be competent to plan and to cook and to serve dinner, but not able to remember the names of my children or my friends. This in and out feature of competence, that it's sometimes there, and sometimes not, presents particular problems in the matter of honoring the choices which some older people will make. These problems concerning competent and incompetent choice may be even more taxing than those involved in the matter of choosing for the people who are permanently incompetent to do so. With reference to healthcare choices for the elderly, there's been activity in both the United States and Canada to extend the competence of older, now incompetent people by way of appointing an individual to act for them with, references to be, with reference to the choices to be made at the time when they're competent so that their choices can take effect when they are no longer able to decide what they wish to have done. This so-called durable power of attorney of the person is chosen by the individual during a time of competence. The person chosen takes over the non-competent individual's choices when that individual has become incompetent. 
This possibility resembles the option we now have of naming someone to look after our financial assets when we become unable to do so. In a way, it resembles the will that we make to take effect after we die. In Canada, the power of attorney for financial affairs is legally recognized. The power of attorney both before death and the naming of those who look after the estate after death. In Canada, the power of attorney of the person for health care decisions has no legal status, although Ontario presently has a bill before its legislature on the point, and other provinces are acting in this direction. It seems obvious that the one to whom I or you might go in terms of having a choice and giving this person the power of choosing, were it legally binding, would be someone who knows us well, someone who would act as we would. After all, I'm asking this person to be my substitute, to stand in my place, to put on my shoes, as one document puts it. This type of decision-making is thus quite different from the kind of decision-making done for the child who has never known choice. For the never competent individual, the ethical standard for choosing seems to be best interest, a notion we explored last evening and this morning with all its complexities. For those who were once competent, the standard is that individual's choice. And the one acting for that individual may be asked, and if she agrees, morally obliged, to take certain actions which are not seen to be in the non-competent individual's apparent best interests. In naming the one to carry out my wishes, I thus must be very careful so that that person does what I want to have done, not what that person wishes to have done. In naming that person, I may choose to leave the decision to her and say something like, do whatever you think is best or do what you think I'd want. On the other hand, I may decide to be quite specific. I never want to have artificial respiratory assistance. No antibiotics, let pneumonia take my life. Between the situation in which I somehow have control, even though I lack mental capacity, and the situation which is current in Canada, there is a difference. At this time in Canada, choices will be made for me, probably by my nearest relative, according to that relative's judgment. That is the law. That relative may decide to honor what I've asked, but there's no legal compulsion to do so. If the durable power of attorney of the person legislation is adopted in Canada, that will change. If I wish to name someone, and the one I name consents, then that one will be legally bound to do what I ask now for when the time comes. And the one I name need not be my nearest relative. This advanced directive mechanism has been proposed as well in the form of the living will. In preparing such a document, again a document which is not legal in Canada, I'm asking that certain action or non-action should prevail in the matter of my care. The document may be an impersonal one, with no individual charged to see that my wishes are fulfilled. It would then be addressed generally to those who care for me when I'm incompetent to make my own choices. The force of any living will in Canada today will be moral only. These are not legal documents. These various moves to preserve some sense of my independent self-direction, even when I currently lack it, point to the high regard we have for autonomy. Indeed, it does dominate the North American approach to adult health care such that many agree we want to die with our rights on. Such an approach, however, may well cause difficulty for the healthcare practitioner. 
The physician, the nurse, have years of education and experience which equip them to recognize our health care difficulties. And they know the best way of obviating or minimizing them. How perplexing, not to say frustrating, it must be for them to know that what could be done to provide good professional caring and what ought to be done in that mode isn't going to be happen isn't going to happen for they will be told that isn't what mother wants much worse for these practitioners to be given specific directions for health care which seem to contradict each other and which leave the physician or the nurse open to the criticism that a high standard of medicine or nursing is not being practiced behind that criticism of course there is the real possibility that the physician will be found professionally incompetent in acquiescing to such directions litigation and court judgment could follow in short the advanced directives as now proposed seem to cause some uneasiness among numbers of physicians similar objections have been made by relatives and by society more generally how do we know what the person really wants now if the person made the judgment then how do we know that the person hasn't changed her mind society will ask questions about the possibility of abuse about undue influence choice information understanding while gaining acceptance then and while these directives seem to point in the direction of autonomy as a high value there are still a number of questions about them of deeper concern however is the question why why do patients fear incompetence as they grow older why do they want certain guarantees with regard to the actions of their relatives or healthcare practitioners at this point we're forced to look more closely at the status we assign to any older incompetent people and to look as well at the way in which we use our own power of competence to label some of them incompetent we return once again to the matter of the possible tyranny of autonomy when older people are judged to be incompetent then someone else does the deciding about health care the place of resident financial management unless the older individual has made clear and somehow binding arrangements with others as regards these matters that older individual has somehow been perceived as having lost uniqueness having lost the ability to say I choose and having lost the ability to carry out that choice such people are seen as dependent and they may well be physically financially and socially they might be perceived as objects rather than as subjects they might be seen as burdens or hindrances to the activities of relatives or one-time friends again a few examples may be helpful the language used by certain healthcare practitioners when first heard by non-healthcare practitioners points to a certain classification of older demented or dementing patients as not worthy of the respect shown to those who are not cognitively impaired again the words demented and dementing are technical words they simply mean that the person's mental status is deteriorating many of us have heard these practitioners use phrases like going to water the vegetables which means I'm going to attend to patients who have severely limited cognitive ability or we have heard the sentence when patients are pleasantly senile we don't need to try too hard to cure the infection from a British journal just last month if the patient is a little crumbly don't discuss the fact that certain procedures like hip replacement could be an option but that the wait will be long 
just let the matter go. Somehow, in the view of people who speak this way, caring for these older, mentally incapacitated patients is not challenging, rewarding, or worthwhile. These patients have a lower status, and some healthcare practitioners act accordingly. Fortunately, what's true of a few practitioners is not true of all. We can think of our own family physicians or the thoughtful and the skilled geriatricians who look after many elderly patients. Nevertheless, there is a prevailing perception of lesser moral status for those who are older and mentally debilitated in the conversation and action among many in the group pledged to help this group of older individuals. And arguably, decisions made for older people within this frame of reference are not necessarily made in the patient's best interest, nor with attention to the patient's previously expressed wishes. Similar comments can be made by relatives. She's really out to lunch, or she's missing something upstairs. These may all be attempts at what is called gallows humor, that is, an ability to come to terms with a tough reality. But the spoken word influences thinking, and we begin to wonder whether this is indeed what we think. To address a similar but a slightly different area of concern, consider what is identified currently as the plight of the sandwich generation. The group in, in question is made up of young parents who are working at home and perhaps outside the home with heavy responsibility for both their own children and the children's grandparents. It may occur that one of the grandparents who has become physically fragile needs the kind of support a family can give without requiring the closer supervision and service which can be provided only in an institutional setting. To begin with, accommodating a three-generation family in what was built to be a home for two generations is not easy. But it may be manageable until granddad becomes more and more forgetful and begins to wander and to become lost on frequent walks outside the home. Clearly, some degree of assistance and protection not available at home will now be required. How will this family assess its responsibility in terms of providing care for him and for the children? Whose interests are served by bringing Granddad to the institution when he does not wish to go? And when it's known that the rate of mortality or morbidity increases drastically, with the institutionalization of elderly people. There may be help available for this family in the community in terms of respite care, but that may not be enough to take care of granddad. There may be volunteers who will help, but again, there may not. A quite different problem arises when younger people are overly protective of their elderly, sometimes forgetful relatives. Thus, I must take over the financial arrangements for dad and mother. I don't want them to be foolish with their resources. They are 75, you know. Or we really shouldn't let mother go out alone. She has forgotten or could forget to call us to take her home. Or, just to be very personal about it, a request from one of my own younger children as I was leaving home the other day, you won't forget to call us from the airport, will you? <laughs> Hardly. There's no other way to get home. Um, in this case, the standard may be concern to protect from harm or best interest. It may be a misinterpretation of need, making the slightly forgetful relative ever more housebound and dependent and depriving the individual of the stimuli needed to keep mentally alive and thus to slow down any degenerative process or externally induced depression. Depriving these individuals who have capacity for some independent decision-making of the opportunity to exercise that decision-making before their time of full dependency has come 
is surely a very cruel twist of the parentalism standard. Last in the series of examples here, the matter of elder abuse. Some alleged neglect or abuse may well be in the perception of the individual who receives such treatment. Much such neglect or abuse can be verified objectively, independently. Thus, one can think of unscrupulous group residence operators who manipulate their dementing residents in the matter of monies available to them. There are cases of dental neglect by family and residential officers which can be documented. Food and social deprivation have been identified in some cases. The list could be lengthened. In Ontario, there is no law about elder abuse. If we were to look for a law, on what ethical standard would we say it should rest? Indeed, on what ethical standard does present practice operate? What view of elderly incompetent individuals do those who behave in these ways instantiate? And what are we prepared to do about it? One obvious approach here is to review the mechanism by way of which individuals who are said to be incompetent are identified. In the case of those who are not comatose or profoundly and obviously demented, how is the classification incompetent determined? Is it that the individuals are slightly eccentric or a nuisance, for example? Is it that their choices do not reflect our own? Is it that they are simply older and thereby, by some people's reckoning, less competent? The determination here must surely be based on the evaluation of the thought process which I outlined earlier, not only on the basis of the status of the decision maker or on the outcome of the decision made, a decision with which we might not agree. To go further, should determination of competence be based on intellectual grounds only? Surely there are many people who are competent in terms of everyday behavior, and it may well be that other standards beyond intellectual functioning should be used. Who is to make this decision, and is it done directly or by way of another's report? For example, will it be based on a report given by the family, which is quite distraught and under pressure, to the physician, and then the physician signs in the absence of examination? Or will it be done by direct examination? Of course we know that in Canada, the physicians only advise about incompetence. Incompetence can only be declared by a judge. Nonetheless, physicians' judgment about incompetence is often taken as given. We bear in mind that the practice of medicine relies on contract law and contract law requires competent co-signers, if you like, and therefore we're into an area of legal definition. Now, whoever it is who's going to make this decision has a very real burden insofar as the outcome of the decision may be to deprive another, that is, to make an erroneous decision about independent judgment in all the critical areas mentioned. How are those who are going to make these everyday decisions, for there are far too many to go to court each time, how are these people educated? How are they sensitized to the intersecting human values which are implicit in such decision making? In the end, of course, the grounding for much of the practice of elder ethics rests on the concept we have of older people in terms of their ability or their inability to think and to choose. If autonomy, or the lack of it, is the standard by which we are going to bisect the human race, the consequences for those individuals who are on the other side of the line could be quite devastating. Perhaps that's the real message in the social pressure for legalization of advanced directives and living wills 
I see what happens to non-autonomous people. I'm frightened of that. I don't want it to happen to me. Beyond this, of course, are the played out consequences in the matter of resource sharing. Should those who are not only older, but also cognitively impaired, be given less on that ground alone? Should they be encouraged to opt out? And that has been a suggestion made by Dan Callahan from the Hastings Center. Should they be encouraged to opt out of the use of the healthcare system so that children, for example, or young parents could have ever more of the smaller fund of social resources? On the other hand, do we owe these people anything in terms of their past service to us? And if so, how does then or the past equate with now or the present? The particular aspects of elder ethics raised here are likely to become ever more acute as the numbers of older people increase and the resources to serve all of us continue to shrink. Indeed, that problem is already acute. Perhaps more personally telling is our own unknown personal future. How would or will we wish to be treated when, if, we begin to be crumbly or pleasantly senile? It may be that we will be totally non-comprehending and thus not aware of what is occurring. In that case, however, we may still be open to be wronged, even if not harmed. However, if we are comprehending in the slightest, then what do we wish for that time? And if we were to become totally mentally incompetent, is there some direction we'd like to give right now? Direction which is legally enforceable and professionally practical. Do we, as older people ourselves, have any obligation right now to make the burden of decision-making easier for our children, our relatives. Beyond statistical and personal argument, there is clearly the need for public thinking, for public lobbying, for public education, and careful public policy-making in this area. And that's the work for all of us, as teachers, parents, as young people on the way to being older. These reflections on elder ethics within the more general context of the tyranny of autonomy point to the continuing need to use that yardstick very carefully so that we will not be tyrants, so that we will not use the yardstick selfishly for our own purposes. These reflections also point to the need to balance reliance on autonomy as ethical criterion with reliance on other ethical values like compassion, respect for dignity, fairness. Unless we do this, we shall indeed be subject to the tyranny of autonomy. And now, as bringing this series to a close and perhaps as a summing up, to continue to emphasize the difference between mental competence and incompetence, to emphasize the concept of autonomy, if you choose to use that language, as if it were the critical ethical benchmark, can only result in most unhappy social and personal consequences. Further, as a standard for practice, it is imprecise, difficult to apply, and open to the possibility of unfair use. For us to use autonomy, or lack of it, as a way to identify them, to argue that they have a handicap while we do not, is not only self-serving, but self-deceptive. Which of us here is without handicap? Genetic, intellectual, social, spiritual, aesthetic. As Pogo has reminded us, we is them. In my view, it's time to put autonomy in its proper place, not to let it tyrannize us, and not to use it as a weapon to tyrannize others. 
If we recall that we have once been children with others making decisions for us, if we recall that we will one day be older with the serious probability that others will make decisions for us, if we recall that we all have handicaps of a kind such that others are more proficient in certain areas than we and could choose better for us in these areas, then we'll recognize that there is a serious challenge before us. What we must do is attempt to recognize our sameness with all other human beings, despite the differences we have. We must attempt to find strength in our recognized weaknesses. To do this, we will need more than human wisdom. Thank you. Dr. Lynch has kindly agreed to respond to any questions or comments you might have. May I ask you to know that a microphone has been placed in the central aisle for your use so that everyone can hear you and for the purpose of recording for posterity your insightful remarks. I'd like to use the privilege of the chair to ask you, what more can we use but human wisdom? You said we need more than human wisdom. What else is left? I guess I was using that in, uh, what should we say, the liberal sense. I was referring to the community in which we are, the uh, faith community, meaning that I think some of these problems can be resolved uh, more accurately by reflection on faith and uh, by reflection on theology. And so we could call it human wisdom if we've taken it within ourselves. On the other hand, it's not humanly generated unless it's given. So I was really calling for some kind of guidance, if you want to call it that, which is supernatural. And it seemed to me that this was the kind of community in which that kind of uh, remark might be apt. <laughs> so. I can speak to it, but I'm sure that you and the people who work in your agency are much better able to respond to that than I. Uh, certainly in terms of the theory of it, at least, we could argue that what we have in mind is the best interest of the older person. But in fact, we also have to take account of the fact uh, that the persons who look after the older person are the meat in the sandwich, that they probably have younger people for whom they're also responsible, and that if they don't look after those children, the Child Protection Agency will be upon them. And if they don't look after themselves, they're not going to be able to help either the younger or the older. And so it seems to me that in a society which has become increasingly aware of its rights or its individual choices, the rights of individuals, where the family is not the kind of family which has been together, or we don't have the ideal family, whatever that may be anymore, Increasingly, we're going to have to turn to society in some way to pick up some of the kinds of burdens that other relatives used to be able to take care of or neighbors. And particularly when the older individuals or any who are cognitively impaired really cannot be maintained at home, even with respite care. I mean, we can try all of those, but sooner or later, we're going to have to say this won't work. Now, it may be that what we could try to do, and I don't know a place where it has been done except on a very informal basis, is to think of older shared living or shared living for older people in some kind almost of group home arrangement as contrasted with the larger institutions. But this becomes very expensive. 
and this becomes very demanding of personnel, high touch, not high tech. And therefore, we begin to say again, is society ready to do it? <laughs> so we're really talking, I think, in the end about society's will to apportion its resources or to raise the level of resources available to the kind of protection we say we want, <laughs> but we maybe don't provide. Certainly in Toronto, there have been a number of scandals about group homes in which elderly persons are placed. And I referred to some of those where people are cheated out of their money or they don't get dental care because the operators are trying to save money. And you can understand that. They, they haven't got the money. So the very serious problem, it seems to me, not as somebody who's in the field but who's teaching the physicians who are there, is that somehow we have to make social choice. We have to bring it up front and say, what are we going to do? hiding behind it or providing care that's substandard may be an answer for the moment, but it isn't going to be an answer in the middle of the night when you're worried about your grandparents and what's happening to them. Yes? Thank you very much. And I, I think that's borne out certainly as I watch some of the American experience, the uh, gray power movement, where people are coming together because they may be frightened to speak individually, but collectively can do great wonders in terms of social power. And they combine, even though no one of them seems able or willing to do it alone, collectively they support each other and do it. And similarly, in terms of courses like your own, of gerontology and in other places, let's say at the University of Toronto, we're beginning to find that the students who are coming are older people themselves who want to go out and do something about it for their peers who may be less likely to come forward. So I think we're beginning to see, if you want to put it that way, older people coming forward in a variety of ways. It's pretty intimidating. Uh, no matter how old or young one is, to stand in front of a group like this and to say, this is what I think, you know, because uh, these are very intelligent people out here. And you may say, I haven't got the experience. I don't know, so I better not speak. So we almost have to re-empower people to speak out. I was speaking of the specific possibility of naming a durable power of attorney for health care. Uh, now, when we speak about the legal guardian, the legal guardian may be named because the person is incompetent in many ways and has, among other powers, the power to look after finances and health. But very specifically, some people would wish to have an individual named who does nothing but health care so that it wouldn't be, if you want to call it somebody from the legal guardian's office, I'm, I'm not as familiar with Nova Scotia 
as I would be with uh, Ontario. But specifically, I should be able to write down, I want my second child to be the one who speaks for me in this matter of health care, and I want my older son to be the one who looks after my financial business, and I'm going to distinguish those. So there has been a lot of uh, talk about that, and it is legal in many parts of the United States to name somebody who's going to look just after the health care decisions. Then the distinction comes as to whether I'm going to direct that person specifically this, 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 or whether I'm just going to say, do for me what you know, and we'll have a conversation about what it is I'd want. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lynch, could you talk about the benefit and burden of care for a few moments? Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, question Father asks uh, comes, came particularly from discussion that we had yesterday in terms of the care of children. And the question turned uh, on the whole notion of prolonging the life of children or not in terms of having severe early uh, birth anomalies, genetic defects, if you want to speak of that, or physical kinds of difficulties, and whether these children should have their lives prolonged, which is possible in terms of medical technology. Uh, we were speaking about very young children, and if we wanted to make the case as difficult as possible, we'd be speaking about some of those very small premature infants who might be in the 750 gram area where survival is a questionable matter. And when I was speaking about that and the decisions that parents make for health care for very young children, whether the standard would be best interest, meaning that you always had to preserve life, or whether best interest could sometimes mean that you let life go, or whether the standard had to be the rest of the individuals in the family, what would benefit them, or whether the standard had to be what society would find best because there's so many children who are sick. I was saying that a way in which it seemed to me that current uh, Catholic theology is moving is to speak in terms of burdens and benefits. The suggestion had been that we might say that ordinary means of prolonging life are required, and I was suggesting that I think that has changed. Uh, the reason that I think it's changed is because ordinary and extraordinary can mean many things to many people. For example, extraordinary means to a physician may mean something that's quite uh, complicated, and it, or I'm sorry, ordinary means to a physician might mean something that's very complicated when I look at it. For the physician, extraordinary might mean a 1% to 2% chance of good prognosis. So the physician's view of ordinary, extraordinary, and my view of that could be quite different. Equally, the legal view of extraordinary could be that it has to be gotten from St. John's or Montreal. It's not available here. It's not readily available. So the standard which is being discussed much more than ordinary, extraordinary, is burden and benefit. And it's not the burden and the benefit to the community. By burden, we simply mean how much pain for how much gain. We're not doing that so much in terms of the community, which could easily write off the most expensive members and say, it's too expensive to do that. We need it for this. What I was referring to was the balance of burden and benefit in terms of individuals, and particularly of competent individuals. That for some individuals, the burden, for example, of continuing treatment might be too great in terms of the benefit which would be derived. I'm not talking about suicide, and I'm not talking about assisted suicide. What I'm talking about is the knowledge that this particular treatment is not going to restore me to the place where I've been or to a reasonable use of my life. And at that point, I am able to say the burden is greater than the benefit. So it's a standard that's being used by theologians like uh, Richard McCormick. Uh, again, I'm sorry I'm ignorant of the kinds of theologians who are discussed in this particular city, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but uh, what it's being called is proportionalism. Uh, there are many people who would say that it's uh, to be condemned. Uh, certainly McCormick, as he uses it in the discussion of healthcare ethics, is making it such that it will be tailored to the individual situation. Another of the theologians, now philosophers, talking that way is uh, Johnson, Albert Johnson. So it really is emphasizing the personal choice which has to be made by the individual. Now the question comes whether one individual can talk about the burden benefit for the other in terms of the children. And there we have a very real problem because we're meant to estimate that burden and benefit in terms of the child, not in terms of the parent's best interests particularly. But you can't estimate burden and benefit unless you've got pretty clear sense of prognosis. 
And for these 750 gram people, it's very difficult to say how many will be blind, how many might be deaf, how many maybe couldn't walk. So <laughs> trying to estimate burden benefit for them is an extremely chancy thing. The best one is able to do is to estimate it as fairly and honestly as you can. As I said last night, the best possible choice, not necessarily the best. But once it's made, the best possible choice is the choice. And you might do it differently next time, but it's the best possible choice for that time. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, not everybody could hear you, but I heard you, and, and we're talking about community uh, care and the possibility of helping families to maintain an elderly person at home, and that in many instances, people don't know that that is available, and that in this area, it is available, and many people don't seem to know about it, so they don't take advantage of it. And had I any experience in terms of knowing uh, that people don't know, so to speak, and the answer to that is yes, that there are many people who don't know that that service is there. But the answer to it is also that even if they know, they're on such long waiting lists that it's almost impossible to get. Now that's the city of Toronto, it's a busy place in the province of Ontario. And home care has only become a possible, the cost of it under OHIP in the last little while and on a fairly limited basis. So I don't wanna make any kind of real statement about that because it's not my area of expertise. But it has led to all kinds of volunteer kinds of agencies which are looking for funding. Uh, for example, there's a particular linking program which links the individual who has cancer and that family with all of the persons in the community who can be helpful. Now, clearly, we're not going to have the need for that if the other kind of agencies are already doing it or if they have spaces available. So my sense is that maybe people don't know, but some who really know are starting new services. So maybe they say there's not enough there. The Elizabeth Seaton Lecture have now come to a close. It is my privilege as Chair of the Religious Studies Department to thank all of you, hearers and listeners, and to thank our speaker, Dr. Lynch, for her stimulating presentation. Healthcare decision making for others is a matter that is morally problematic, pastorally delicate, legislatively thorny, constitutionally insecure, medically normless, humanly anguishing, racially provocative, journalistically abused, personally biased, and widely ignored. Therefore, it demands a most extraordinary discipline of human thought, one that is penetrating without being impenetrable, humanly compassionate without being com morally compromising, legally realistic without b being legally positivistic, instructed by other disciplines without being determined by them, informed by tradition without being enslaved by it. It is a severe testing ground for moral reflection. Dr. Lynch, your presentation is transparent of the rigor, fullness, and balance that one must bring to moral problems in the field of healthcare decision for other people. Many of us are bone weary of the subject but we cannot afford to indulge this fatigue. 
We are very grateful to you, Dr. Lynch, for having helped us to cut through the confusion regarding this topic. Thank you, and until next year.